eight years old, your cousin's ex-wife had a sexual encounter with you. Mm -hmm. And you talk about these sexual encounters changing your personality thereafter. When did you decide to speak about this? And, and when did you begin to learn the implications that that one instant sort of incident when you were that age had had on you throughout your life? Well, I used to always make jokes about it, right? Because, I, you know, I used to always say, um, you know, I, 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 I used to always say that I, I used to buy these, they used to be like these little firecrackers that were like these little poppers. Mm -hmm. So you could throw them on the ground and they would pop. And so it's like one day I just started throwing them at her because I didn't want her to touch me. And um, when when I did that, she started calling me ugly, like literally from that moment, like, oh, you ugly, you got a big nose. You know, she'd be telling everybody, look at his nose, I think his nose is swollen. So like, to the point where my grandma, God bless the dead, would like take cream and put it on my nose to try to reduce the swelling. But it wasn't swollen, she was just messing with me. So in my mind, it was like a psychological thing. Like she was, she was, she was messing with me mentally. And how old was she? I don't know, you know. She was 30, 40, 50? Oh yeah, she was definitely older, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And you were eight? I was eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, I remember her, I remember her, uh, me telling people the reason I made her stop is because I didn't like the smell of her jerry curl. So that was always, that was always the joke. And I remember watching uh, Tyler Perry on Oprah Winfrey show. And I remember watching him cry over an older woman who molested him. And I remember thinking to myself, what's wrong with him? Because the way we rationalized it in our mind is like when you're young, you just used to talk about it like it was a sexual encounter. And it was, when I think about it now, like I had like me and like, you know, three of my other younger friends and all of us were talking about these sexual encounters we were having with older women. So now that I think back on it, I'm like, damn, we all was getting, you know, molested. You just don't look at it like that when you're a young man. When you look at it, when you're a young man, you look at it like I'm just getting action early. So when I saw... You know, Tyler on Oprah, that's when I first started like thinking about it. And I remember this was, I forgot what year this was, but this was way, way, way back in the day. But I remember there, there was Twitter and I remember tweeting about it, but I was tweeting about it in jest, like, you know, like wondering like, what the hell's wrong with Tyler Perry, you know? But then I had to start asking, well, what's wrong with me? That, <laughs> like I, that I'm not reacting to being molested the way that, you know, he is. But then you don't even realize that it's molestation until you get Oh, well, at least I didn't realize it until I got older. And I was like, oh, I was getting molested. And then when you start going to therapy and you start peeling back, you know, the layers of that, that, that trauma, you start realizing, oh, this is why I am the way I am in regards to pleasing people. Because I felt like even though what she was doing to me was wrong and it made me uncomfortable and I didn't like it, I had to keep doing it. So she'd stop calling me ugly. Cause her calling me ugly was really, really, really hurting my feelings. You know what I mean? As a young eight year old mm -hmm. kid. So that's, that leads to you being a older adult who's a constant people pleaser because you don't want to let nobody down because you know, if you let them down and they'll talk bad about you, you know, but that you realize you got to set those boundaries. Cause if those people are going to, if, if making, if you making yourself uncomfortable is the only way to please said individual, that individual don't need to be in your life. That's not somebody that you have, have, have in your, your circle at all. You've never gone back and found out who that person was and that, uh, done anything about it? No, I see her. You, you still see her? Yeah, I've seen, I've seen her. I've seen her around in my hometown. Absolutely. You're not interested in? Nah, last time I saw her, actually, she came up to me. This was about, mm, let me see, it's 2024. This probably had to be before COVID. You know, she came up to me at a, at, at a house party and she was like, oh, you so handsome. And I was like, oh, you, you been thought I was handsome. You beat it. <laughs> like, like you been thought I was handsome. Like, knock it off. <laughs> your, your behavior becomes problematic. 15 years old, 1993. I watched, I sort of read through from you were 15 up until your sort of early 20s, up to, to sort of 23 years old. And there was um, quite a shocking pattern of behavior involving drugs and other things. I, I was wondering- Not that early. 15, I was, still in, I was still in high school. So I was, I was, I was, I was the, the disciplinary problems from started in middle school. It started when I was in like seventh grade and the disciplinary problems started just because, you know, my older cousins were like, 
what you would call, I guess, bullying me, right? Like they would, I, I was wearing glasses and I had the fanny pack and I was in like what they had, they, they used to call it, uh, the classes were broken down in letters. So it was like A, A and C were for like the smart students, mm-hmm. right? So I was in like the A class and it was only like two black people in the class, two or three black people in the class, right? Rest is all white. And so like I would be with a lot of white people for the most part. And like uh, my cousins who, we're all from my daddy's uh, side of town. They would bully me, like literally, like they would just beat up on me because I'd be with all the white kids. Because my dad is like a, a was a really cool dude, you know, like he was like a the the the, the guy who always had like the small little sugar shack where you could come over there and get your alcohol and stuff like that. And you know, he, he used to hustle his, his, his drugs stuff like that. People knew my pops. My pops was a cool dude, so they they thought I was supposed to be like that. So being that I wasn't like that, they was like they would bully me and. Um, it just became one of those things where it was like, yo, if you can't beat them, join them. So it's like, yo, my glasses fell off my face, you know, one too many times. And like that one time where they fell and they just broke for good, that's when I broke for good. And I was just like, you know what? If I can't beat them, join them. So I, I just started hanging with them. And like in order to hang with them, I had to be, I guess, like worse than them to prove myself in a lot of ways. So that's when like the disruption really started in class. That's when the the class clown, you know, really started to happen. And that just evolved into me getting left back a couple of times. You know, I think I I went to summer school twice in seventh and eighth grade. Then I got left back in ninth grade. And that's when I actually had to stay back. And then by the time I got to, by the time I got to 10th grade, um, I was getting kicked out of the school I was in, Berkeley High School, and they transferred me to the Scrafford High School where my mom taught, because they thought if I was at my mom's school, then I would act better. But most of my problems from that point on started to be in the street, more so than, you know, in school. And so I ended up getting uh, in a situation where I was with, you know, some of my homeboys and a shooting happened and we all ended up going to jail and they actually came and arrested me from Scrafford High School. And that's the last time I was in uh, a, a high school. And you sat in jail for three months? No, it was like 40, I think 45 days, something like that. Yeah. Your dad could have bailed you out? My dad could have bailed me out, um, but he wanted to teach me a lesson. Like he wanted me to learn from my mistakes. So he, he let me sit in there for, for 45 days. And, and, and sadly that wasn't it, it, it was a wake up call, but it wasn't the wake, wake up call. It was more like I woke up, but then I hit the snooze button. <laughs> you know, slept for, a little, slept for a little while longer before I finally got up. As a grown man, you can look back now and think that 15, 16 year old kid, he needed something that he wasn't getting. He needed a bunch of things he just wasn't getting. Because you've got kids now yourself. So you can, you, if, you, if you saw that behavior in your kid, you wouldn't say, oh, I, well, I don't know, I'm putting words in your mouth here, but you probably wouldn't think, okay, they need to go to jail and sit in jail for a while. You'd probably look at it and go, there's something unmet there. Man, that's such an interesting question because when I do think back on it, I say to myself, I didn't have to do none of that. Like that's my mindset now. Like I didn't have to do any of that. Like um, my mother was an English teacher. She was a Jehovah's Witness. My grandmother was a Baptist. They absolutely taught me better. Like I absolutely positively knew better. I had the example of my father, you know, if my father had been probably more honest with me about um, his life and you know, the things he had went through and who, 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 who he was, then I probably would have seen a lot of those obstacles coming. Cause I got to the point, even when I started selling drugs, when I found out he was also selling drugs, you, you can't tell me not to do it. You know, like you, like you can't be on some, um, don't do as I do, do as I say type stuff. I remember us having that conversation and he was like, well, this is my house. So you're not going to be doing that in my house. Like, cause now you, you making me hot. <laughs> right? <laughs> like, li- like literally. And so I feel like, you know, for me, I was just a young, impressionable kid who wanted what every single human being wants. And that's just simply security. And if you don't get security, you know, from people, you will, you will find a way to get it. So me, you know, becoming that, that version of myself I was then was, that was just literally for security. That was for survival. Like I was just literally a kid that was tired of getting bullied. But you know, once you get down on that path, you know, if nobody stops you, there will be things that stop you, like jail. 
you know, or sadly in some cases, death, but then it's too late. So I just always thank God that, you know, even though I, I got caught up and I made those mistakes, I was able to, you know, finally, you know, wake up. If you love the Diary of a CEO brand and you watch this channel, please do me a huge favor, become part of the 15% of the viewers on this channel that have hit the subscribe button. It helps us tremendously and the bigger the channel gets, the bigger the guests.